And this is just too much. This idea of war is, as far as I can see, only supported by the uh, Israel and its supporters and the contractors who will make a lot of money on this war. The last war, these, this Afghanistan and Iraq were the most profitable wars for these people in U.S. history. And they don't want the money flow to stop. Because that money goes right from the Treasury to them. There's not even an accounting for it. So that's what they want. They want this money to flow to them. And it will destroy us. I know some people are in favor of it because it will destroy our economy and the next election will go against the president. So they are there for this. There's, this is the kind of thing that will impose police, you know, a lot more police brutality and supervision in our country because there's bound to be some opposition. Now, on a personal note, we're a military family. And my son-in-law is in Afghanistan for his sixth tour. And the kids are five and three and a half, and they haven't seen their, seen their dad much at all. And as a military family, we are worn out. He is supposed to come back in either March or April. But if Israel attacks Iran, we have no idea when we will ever see him. Yeah. And we, as military families, only make up one or one and a half percent of the population. And people aren't aware of the suffering that's being inflicted on our military and our families. We have to worry every day that that staff car is going to roll up in front of the door with the chaplain and an officer in it. We never know what's going to happen. And for him to be away that long, you know, he's a Marine, so they're supposed to be seven months over there and seven months back. But when he gets back, he's really only with us for 30 days. Then they get replacements, then they have to train them up, then they have to go to 29 Palms for desert training. And then they have another, the last month is intensive training before they go back. The Army goes for a year or 15 months, and then they come back. And the, the Pentagon fools people by saying, oh, the 4th Infantry has been back for three years. That's not true. The flag has been here, and the non-combat people have been here. But the bullet stoppers have, have transferred from the 4th Infantry to the 25th because they're going over. When they come back within 90 days, they're transferred over to the 1st Infantry because they're going over. There's a non-stop warfare. And if they're going to have this war, let's have a draft. I want to see a draft, and not only a draft. I want a draft that is prioritized so that every military age child of a senator or house of representatives is drafted first not into a champagne unit but actually put into combat that's the kind of thing if they want a war all right you want a war let's see you go to war let's not see these chicken hawks come in and not serve and like george bush go into a champagne unit and then come out and want to make war and we say in, in in veterans for peace if anyone who's ever really seen a war wouldn't want another one and I want to make sure that all of their children see a war. If they want this war, if that's what they want to do, I want them to sign over their fortunes. I want to tax on wealthy people to pay for it, and I want their kids to have to go. Because unless I see their kids with a rifle in their hand, taking fire from the enemy, then it's not a fair war. It's not, well, it's no war is fair, but it's not just, they cannot go declare war without a, a, a declaration from Congress, you know, a declaration of war, and after all of that, I want to see their children there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And I think, as Mello said, the 99% serve and the 1% profit. Hi, I'm Virginia Hoffler. I'm with Progressive Democrats of America. I'm also with the End the War Coalition, and I've been working hard. I am with the End Wars and Occupations Mission Organizing Team. Democrats of America. Can you hear me? Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. According to recently published reports, Israel issued a blunt warning that time is running out for Iran to end its nuclear program, leaving the Obama administration worried that an Israeli attack may happen this year. 
Earlier this week, it was reported that U.S. spy agencies believe Iran is prepared to launch a terrorist attack inside the United States. The report, which made the front page of the Washington Post, pointed out that U.S. intelligence officials have seen no intelligence to indicate the act of plotting of such an attack, but it's the headlines that everybody remembers, and it's, it will steer up rationales for war that are not discredited until it's too late. Also in the news, the U.S. plans to deploy a floating base in the Persian Gulf that will provide a forward staging area for everything from minesweepers to commandos designed to prevent Iran from following through on its threat to close the Strait of Hormuz. The Pentagon also announced it is developing a new bunker buster bomb after it became clear that our largest bomb, the massive Ordnance Penetrator, is not capable of destroying Iran's most heavily fortified underground facilities. Whether the United States launches a major assault on Iran or Israel does, Iran will retaliate against U.S. troops and probably Israel and possibly the United States itself. And the United States will without doubt re-retaliate for that. Iran cannot be unaware that to attack her. I'm sorry. Iran cannot be unaware that the U.S. government's pressure on the Israeli government not to attack Iran consists only of reassuring the Israelis that the United States will attack when needed and does not even include threatening to stop funding Israel's military or to stop vetoing measures of accountability for Israeli crimes at the United exactly. Nations. In other words, any U.S. pretense of having seriously wanted to prevent an attack is not credible. Of course, many in the U.S. government and military oppose attacking Iran, although key figures like Admiral William Fallon and diplomat George Mitchell have been moved out of the way. Much of the Israeli military is opposed as well, not to mention the Israeli and U.S. people. But war is not ever clean or precise. If the people we allow to run our nation attack another, we are all put at risk. As in any country, no matter what its government, the people of Iran are fundamentally good, decent, peaceful, and fundamentally just like you and me. They're not a different species. They're not evil. A surgical strike against a facility in their country would cause a great many of them to die a very painful and horrible death. Even if you imagine that Iran would not retaliate for such attacks, the attacks in themselves consist of mass murder. And what would that accomplish? It would unite the people of Iran and much of the world against the United States. It would justify in the eyes of much of the world an underground Iranian program to develop nuclear weapons and can move the country closer to weapons development. The environmental damage would be huge, and all talk of cutting the U.S. military budget would be buried in a wave of war frenzy. Civil liberties would be flushed down the toilet, a nuclear arms race would spread to additional countries, and any momentary feelings of national bravado would be outweighed by accelerating home foreclosures, mounting student debt, and more hatred of the others. Weapons possession is not grounds for war, and neither is pursuit of weapons possession. Israel has nuclear weapons. The United States has more nuclear weapons than any other country. There can be no justification for Iran to attack the United States, Israel, or any other country. The pretense that Iran has or will soon have nuclear weapons is just that, a pretense. One that has been revived, debunked, revived again and again. The really absurd part is that it was the United States in 1976 that pushed nuclear energy on Iran. In 2000, the CIA gave the Iranian government plans to build a nuclear bomb. Slightly flawed, but it was a plan. In 2003, Iran proposed negotiations with the United States with everything on the table, including its nuclear technology, and the United States refused. Shortly thereafter, the United States started angling for a war. Meanwhile, the U.S.-led sanctions prevent Iran from developing wind energy, while the Koch brothers are allowed to trade with Iran with impunity. Another ongoing lie is that Iran has not allowed inspectors into its country or given them access to its sites. Iran has, in fact, voluntarily accepted stricter standards than the International Atomic Energy Agency requires. 
While Iran remains in compliance with the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, India and Pakistan and Israel have not signed it, and North Korea has withdrawn from it, while the United States and other nuclear powers continuously violate it by failing to reduce arms, by providing arms to other countries such as India, and by developing new nuclear weapons. Inspections were allowed in Iraq and they worked. They found no weapons, there were no weapons. Inspections are being allowed in Iran and they are working. And let's clear up two more lies. Iran did not blow up, did not try to blow up a Saudi ambassador in Washington, D.C. And Ahmadinejad did not say Israel should be wiped off the map. The translation is a bad one. What it, what he, a more accurate translation is the regime occupying Jerusalem must vanish, vanish from the page of time. The current government of Israel, not this nation of Israel. We Americans say that about our own government half the time every four years. Iran has made it clear that it would approve of a two-state solution if Palestinians approved of it. The U.S. government claims it would prefer to settle its differences with Iran through diplomacy, but the Obama administration did not give diplomacy with Iran a fair chance and instead reverted quickly to brinkmanship and threats. There are good reasons for Iran to mistrust the U.S., which overthrew its elected government in 1953 and supported the brutal Shah and has pursued a regime change policy against it ever since its popular revolution in 1979. The indispensable first goal of diplomacy is to establish trust. Given the history between the two countries, making demands and threats is counterproductive. We need real diplomacy now. There is no military solution to this crisis. Military strikes could only destroy parts of Iran's nuclear program and could very well persuade it to end inspections and revive its nuclear weapons program, the exact opposite of what our government's stated goal is. The massive airstrikes that would be required to have any impact on Iran would cause great loss of life, injury, and devastation and destroy any hope of reconciliation between Iran and the U.S. for many years to come. On January 5, 2012, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff told the press corps that the major ground wars were very much an option and that war, wars of one sort or another were a certainty. President Obama's statement of military policy released at that press conference listed the missions of the U.S. military. First was fighting terrorism, Next, deterring aggression, then projecting power, then WMDs, then conquering space and cyberspace, then nuclear weapons, and after all that, there was mention of defending the homeland. The cases of Iraq and Iran are not identical in every detail, but in both cases, we are dealing with concerted efforts to get us into wars, wars that are based on lies. Planning war and funding war creates its own momentum. Sanctions become, as with Iraq, a stepping stone to war. Cutting off diplomacy leaves few options open. Over 6,300 Americans have died in wars in Iraq and Afghanistan during the last 10 years, and over 45,000 have been wounded in action. The United States has spent over $1.3 trillion funding these wars. We do not need another war with unknown costs and consequences. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. Mitch Rubin is our next speaker. Um, he's with the End the War Coalition. The drumbeat of war on Iran is increasing. But when you listen to the news, you hear all sorts of irrelevant information. It cannot be relevant that Iran adheres to fundamentalism, that it is a flawed democracy and denies women full civil rights, when our ally, the Saudi Arabia, is more fundamentalist, far less democratic, more oppressive than Iran, it is a major U.S. ally. It cannot be relevant that Iran has, over the years, developed a nuclear research program and is pursuing the capacity to develop nuclear weapons when Pakistan, 
India, Israel, and other states are nuclear powers, but U.S. allies. I thought it might be fun to do a little bit of quiz to see if you've gotten past the lack of information through the mainstream media. This is the first question, feel free to answer. Is Iran an Arab country? No. No. Alone among the Middle Eastern peoples conquered by the Arabs, the Iranians do not lose their identity, their language. Ethnic Persians make up 60% of modern Iran. In modern Persian, not Arabic, is the official language. What two countries were responsible in 1953 of overthrowing the Iran's populist government? U.S. U.S. and do well. Okay, that's right. Which countries trained the Shah's brutal internal security service called Sabak? CIA. Israel and the CIA. According to William Blum, the notorious Iranian security service, Sabak, employed torture routinely and was created under the guidance of the CIA in Israel in the 50s. Sabak was instructed in torture techniques by the agency. Virginia covered this a little bit, but which Iranian leader said Israel must be wiped off the face of the map? No. Nobody! <laughs> That's right. He accurately quoted languages the occupation regime over Jerusalem must vanish from the page of time. No, we saw one, one, one regime fade without an attack, and that was the Soviet Union. A, a regime Palestine. can fade without a military attack. Especially the U.S. are not careful. What is, is, what is Iran's defense spending in the last fiscal year of 2011? Seven billion. Twelve billion might be a high estimate. What is Americans' defense spending in the last fiscal year? Seven hundred billion. You know it's seven. So, that's right, seven hundred billion. So Iran's defense budget is two percent of America's. Okay, has Iran launched an aggressive war of conquest against any country, say, since 1900. No. no. That's right. But, uh, According to Juan Cole, the University of Michigan professor, Iran has not launched such a war for 150 years. He states that Iran did not start the Iran-Iraq war. The war began by Iraq invading Iran. In contrast, Israel has attacked Lebanon seven different times. Is Iran a signatory of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty? Yes. Is Israel? No. no. Does the Non-Proliferation Treaty permit a signatory to pursue a nuclear program? Yes. We've got an educated group here. Okay. <laughs> Does Iran currently have any nuclear weapons? No. The court? There's no proof that Iran has nuclear weapons according to the internal the International Atomic Energy Agency, the only international body that has the authority to speak about the subject, and, and it's being managed by a 32 country hard to manipulate board. What this agency said in unequivocal terms is that the nuclear program is fully tracked and monitored, and there is no evidence of diversion of purpose. But quote, it cannot guarantee that it is a, that a secret program is not active anywhere. If Iran obtained a nuclear weapon, would they use it or would mutually assure destruction known as deterrence work? What do you think? No. The majority of, of Israeli intelligence themselves have said that Israel is not, that Iran is not an existential threat to Israel. In other, in other words, as one Paul said, if, if Iran had nuclear weapons, what are the odds of using them? He said probably zero. They are not going to commit suicide. I heard, there was a talk on, on national public radio in Neil, with Neil Conan interviewing Israeli journalist Ronan Bergman. Neil Conan asked, Israel itself possesses some 300 nuclear weapons, maybe more. Why does not deterrence work? Israel, of course, would retaliate if Iran were to use it. This is really journalist said, I know that most of Israel's leaders do not believe that Iran is going to use nuclear weapons against Israel. 
The problem is not the nuclear threat. The Iranians are not stupid. They want to live. And I think most leaders, myself as well, see that only a few people believe that Iran would be hesitant enough, brutal enough, and stupid enough to, nu to use nuclear weapons against Israel. The problem is that once Iran acquires that ability, it will change the balance of power in the Middle East. What percentage of Americans support military action in Iran? 17%. What percentage of Israelis support a military strike against Iran? It's higher. It's 43%. But they did a more interesting poll which showed this. They were asked, would it be better for Israel and Iran to have the bomb or for neither to have it. And 65% of this really said it's better that neither have it. And a remarkable 65% of Israeli Jews, they favored the idea of a nuclear free zone, even when it was explained that this would mean Israel giving up nuclear weapons. Why do you think Iran may want a nuclear weapon? Because it's possible deterrence. If you have a nuclear weapon, you might not get attacked, just like Iraq was attacked when to not have a nuclear weapon. What's the potential cost of war in Iran? Too high. Too high. Well, one, Ron Cole says the population of Iran is about three times that of Iraq. So let's just triple say what the cost of the war in Iraq was. It would cost us three trillion, nine trillion dollars of a long-term cost. 15,000 U.S. troops, 100,000 troops wounded, 1 to 3 million Iranian dead, 12 million Iranian displaced. What percentage, this is the last question, what percentage of the planet's oil supply flows through the Strait of Hormuz adjacent to Iran? 20%. How much? 20%. One fifth. Petroleum is the, the world's most crucial source of energy. One fifth of the oil supply goes through that. About 17 million barrels a day. It's thought that if Iran would block the, the uh, Strait of Hormuz, there would be chaos to follow, but America would stop it right away. But it is said that Iranian, the cost of oil hovering now at $100, billion, $100 per barrel would quickly increase to $200 a barrel, er pros erasing any prospect of economic recovery and possibly plunging the world into a great recession. Look how good that is for American oil companies. Though. It's good for oil, but not good for the rest of us. We need to recognize that once there's an attack on Iran, we cannot easily control the consequences. We need to oppose the drumbeats of war towards Iran. We need a call for negotiations, which includes a call for nuclear bomb free of Iran. Let's end the overt war in Iran before it begins. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. Right. Sheila, did you want to make a There's an Iranian woman in the valley um, whom we invited to be a speaker today. Um, um, and since I have a, a, another hand, I'll just, just, just let me just say this for the moment. Um, she's ill. She's been ill for several days. Too ill, in fact, to write and send me a statement in her behalf. So she and I agreed together on the phone that I would read um, from the book jacket of her book published uh, about a year ago called Ghosts of Revolution. Um, she is um, uh, an assistant professor in the school, uh, the school of Religious Studies at ASU. This woman's name is Shala Talibi. She was imprisoned in Iran from 1977 to 1978, and again from 1993 to from 1983 to 1992 first by the former Shah and later by the Islamic Republic for her political beliefs and activities. Um, and I want to mention that um, uh, when I read this book, it is about the past from her experiences. And she um, and I want to mention that, um, uh, of course, we all know that there are millions of people practicing Islam with integrity and devotion. Um, 
So keep that in mind as I read her words from, this particular, from these particular years. This is from the book, of, book jacket of Shala's book. Quote, opening the enormous metal gate, the guard suddenly took away my blindfold and asked me, tauntingly, if I would recognize my parents. With my eyes hurting from the strange light and anger in my voice, I assured him that I would. Suddenly, I was pushed through the gate and the door was slammed behind me. After more than eight years, here I was, finally out of jail, unquote. This is, uh, this is um, the book jacket writing also. In this haunting account, Shala Talibi remembers her years as a political prisoner in Iran. Talibi, along with her husband, was imprisoned for nearly a decade and tortured, first under the Shah and later by the Islamic Republic. Writing about her own suffering and survival and sharing the stories of her fellow inmates, she details the painful reality of prison life and offers an intimate look at a critical period of social and political transformation in Iran. Somehow through it all, with resistance and resolute hope, passion and creativity, Talibi shows how one survives. Reflecting now on experiences past, she stays true to her memories, honoring the love of her husband and friends lost in these events, to relate how people can hold to moments of love, resilience, and friendship over the dark forces of torture, violence, and hatred. At once deeply personal, yet clearly political, part memoir and part meditation, this work brings to heartbreaking clarity how deeply rooted torture and violence can be in our society. More than a passing judgment of guilt on a monolithic, quote, Islamic State, unquote, Talibi's writing asks us to reconsider our own responses to both contemporary debates of interrogation techniques and government responsibility, and more simply, to basic acts of cruelty in daily life. She offers a lasting call to us all. Now, I'd like to mention one other woman. I have a fairly new neighbor, also an Iranian woman, who is here in order to practice meditation with a group of people who meditate. I invited her to come today. She declined to send a statement saying that this kind of activism is not her calling. But she did tell me that she went to a four-hour meditation session this morning with a focus on world peace. I am going to speak now about women in black for a moment. I need to get this out. Triple duty here a, a bit. Um, does anyone here not know about women in black at all? Oh, okay, all right. Um, what, I'd like to, what I'd like to do is, I'd like to read to you um, the basic, the, the international um, statement of philosophy about Women in Black International. And then it also, since it's been quite a while since I've done so, I'd like to read the local flyer that we hand out to people who pass by our vigils. Women in Black is an international network of women and all other supporters working for peace by the name by the name Women in Black since 1988. It was begun by Israeli and Palestinian women coming together um, in uh, with signs saying we refuse to be enemies and we refuse to hate each other. It's been suggested to me that I not mention to you that I'm reading my own handwriting because I've been without a computer for several weeks. So this is not as smooth as the neatly typed pages that Mitch and Virginia had to read from. And of course, Dennis can speak clearly forever. So please bear with me. Um, no, I think he's still here, maybe. In Women in Black, our signature global event is a silent vigil to protest war, rape as a tool of war, ethnic cleansing, and human rights abuses all over the world. We are silent because mere words cannot express the tragedy that wars and hatred bring.
Our strategy of silence ensures that the sounds of a passing ambulance, shots fired, or a bomb exploding nearby will be heard and not avoided. Our silence is visible. We invite women and all others to stand with us. We wear black as a symbol to mourn for all victims of war, to mourn the destruction of people, nature, and the fabric of life itself. Womeninblack.org, I would like you to know that womeninblack.org is the international website where worldwide information is available, including, including the impending war that we are gathering about today. Women around the globe, there are vigils in, I think, almost every country in the world. And Women in Black post um, on an international listserv and also on the international website. I can assure you that the posts are heart-wrenching and inspiring. Uh, they are, Women in Black around the world are doing the kind of substantial work that we all hope we don't have to do because they are oftentimes living in countries where they are where the, at, at war where they are at war in their own neighborhoods and in their own countries such as Afghanistan and Iraq I would now like to read our local flight this is the flyer that we hand out to people this this is um, a brief version of the tenets, the worldwide tenets of Women in Black. And these tenets are apply around the world. We oppose the buildup of arms and the deployment of troops worldwide. We protest the impoverishment of citizens by their governments for the sake of war. We demand an end to human rights abuses at home and abroad. We condemn racial and ethnic bigotry, hatred, and government policies which divide us rather than unite us. We embrace the right of all people to freely choose their own form of government. We support nonviolent and just solutions to domestic and international conflicts. We advocate an end to the glorification of violence in our culture and demand adequate services for victims of international domestic violence and as well as domestic violence and child abuse. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Sheila. <laughs> Women in Black. Wednesday. The local Phoenix vigil is Wednesdays, 5 to 6, Burton Bar Library at the east entrance to the library. Now, I've been vigiling on my own for quite some time, so I've had the luxury of being a little a little flexible about time. So if I'm not right there at 5, please don't give up. We do, we do wear all black, and we practice silence during our, during our hour of vigiling. You're welcome to come, men, women, and children, um, LGBTQ, and we, um, we, um, Oh, I, I, I don't remember what else I, I look forward to seeing you. Oh, you may come for part of the hour as well as all of the hour, or bring a chair if that would if that would make you more comfortable. Yeah, just hang out, be comfortable. Thank you, Liz. Sheila, Sheila, yeah. Sheila. Yes. Now we have a celebrity among us, Code King Liz. Yeah, Liz. Woo! Thank you, Edwina. <laughs> so thanks for everybody being here today. It means a big. It's a very big deal. You know, this is happening in 56 <coughs> cities around the U.S. as well as around the world. Everybody's speaking out against sanctions, and certainly here in the U.S. we say no military intervention. And sanctions really hurt the people of any of these countries. If you look back, sanctions really hurt, uh, you know, the regime in South Africa, but the people suffered also. And so, Sanctions are really in Iraq. If you look at back in 1991 with sanctions in Iraq and a no-fly zone, you know, 500,000 children died from preventable disease. Things that people would be up in arms in this country if that happened. 
And that's the reality. So we all know that war is not the answer. No, U.S., BP, the U.K., Britain, military intervention is a no-win here for anybody in the region, certainly for our country. We have so many things to rebuild right here. We need a single-payer system of health care for everybody. We all deserve that. A single-payer, not warfare. We all should have uh, education and all these things. We need to rebuild our country with the money that the war racket is siphoning off. So I would really encourage everyone to please make calls to certainly out of control McCain and Kyle and any other person. But the last thing I'd like to share, you know, I'm with, and I have done a lot of work with this group called CodePink.org. Thank you. You know, it's a very deep group. We've taken citizen diplomacy, not myself, but the group has taken citizen diplomacy trips to Iran, to speak to civil society, to speak to women, to see how people live. And the fact of the matter, when they come home, they say to us, and some of you know these people, Jess and Leslie, they went to Iran and then they did a tour. In fact, I'm wearing Leslie's shirt right now that she made for me. Peace in Iran. And, you know, when they came back, you know what they told us? They told us that the people of Iran are a beautiful people. They were hospitable. They were lovely people. And much like us, right here. They also do not want war. They don't want any part of this American democracy. You must be in a nightmare if you think that's the American dream. I mean, really. So we'll just leave it up to all of us right here to do our part and do more. And we cannot accept more militarism, more out of control violence and prolonged suffering. The Middle East, there are brothers our sisters, the people of Iran, they deserve every bit of our effort to stand up for them. So thanks for being here today, everybody. I appreciate you all. Thank you, Liz. Speaking of which, if you remember the uh, time that McCain actually declared his presidency and at the Republican event convention, Liz ran down front to uh, say McCain was a maniac, not for peace. So she continues to work, and we're very thankful. All right, my name is Barbara Taft. I represent several groups, all opposed to war with Iran. My main groups are Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, or WILP, and the Baptist Peace Fellowship of North America, or BPFNA. I'm co-chair of the U.S. WILF Middle East Committee and a member of the board of the BPFNA. I'm here today to bring a few ideas forward that are being discussed in those groups, and among these ideas are, first, Iran was the first country in the Middle East to call for a nuclear free zone there. That happened under the Shah, but has been reiterated by the current Iranian regime. It seems strange, second point, that Israel, a nation known to possess upwards of 300 nuclear warheads and which has not submitted to inspections, would be pushing so hard for war on Iran, a nation that has not yet reached the status of having even one nuclear warhead. Iran also has been diligent in submitting to inspections of its nuclear facilities, and the inspections all have indicated that the pro program is domestic in nature. Third, this last week I received a report, in fact yesterday, from some friends in Brazil, and it indicates another reason for Israel to be beating the drums of war against Iran. I've known for several years, and some of you also know, that Israel discovered oil off the coast of the Gaza Strip. How many of you knew that? Few of you do. According to an article in the Asia Times that was forwarded to me from my friends in Brazil, Israel is involved in discussions with China to do a number of things, one of which would be providing oil to China within a few years. 
Iran is a competitor for such a lucrative oil contract, and Israel wishes to eliminate its competition. We need to keep in mind that the people who are experts on these sorts of things, and I don't claim to be an expert, all indicate that there is no weapon powerful enough to destroy Iran's most deeply buried nuclear facility. They also say that Iran does not now have, nor can it possibly have within a year's time, the capability to build even one nuclear warhead. That would seem to imply that there still is time for diplomacy. And those of us who prefer peaceful solutions should be very actively pursuing diplomatic options rather than military ones. Don't you all agree? Yeah. Now I'd like to tell you what a few of the experts have been saying about this all. And we have to keep in mind that two different scenarios have been presented for war against Iran. One is that Israel will attack Iran, and this is variously projected as imminent or that it's not going to happen anytime soon. It depends on who you listen to. With the current hawkish leadership in Israel, this is impossible to predict accurately. And we need to work on our own government, both executive and legislative government branches, to lean on Israel not to attack. Supposedly that's what they're doing, but we don't know how hard they're leaning, and we also never know how hard and how well Israel listens. The second option is that the U.S. would be the attacker, acting as a proxy for Israel. And I think we've all put together the relationship between what Israel's saying now and what it said in regard to Iraq in the lead up to that war. If diplomats can muster the political courage to pursue them and space for real diplomacy isn't closed off entirely by the escalating press toward war by Congress and the media. Secretary of Defense Panetta, according to the same article, explained on 60 Minutes, the consensus is that if they decided to do it, it would probably take them, that's Iran creating a bomb, about a year to be able to produce a bomb and then possibly another one to two years in order to put it on a deliverable vehicle of some sort in order to deliver that weapon. So I think there's time for diplomacy and we need to push for diplomacy as much as we can. The Friends Committee on National Legislation, Friends, Quakers, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, wrote, new Iran sanctions just went into effect last week and more sanctions are coming out of the Senate Banking Committee. Three decades of sanctions have not persuaded Iran to agree to full transparency of its nuclear program. Continued pressure could have the effect of pushing Iranian leaders to demonstrate their power. Instead, the U.S. should be finding ways to keep Iran within the international community, open lines of diplomatic communication, and reduce the incentives for Iranian leaders to take Iran's nuclear program to the next level. Richard Falk, United Nations Special Rapporteur on Palestinian Human Rights, says a nuclear free zone in the Middle East with the participation of Israel can avoid a war in the region. One of the things that is being called for, and I'm going to go off of the script because I, I don't want to waste your time, but one of the things that's being called for, Ban Ki-moon is calling for a conference which should include both Iran and Israel talking about non-proliferation. Rather than escalating, we need to de-escalate the conflict once people start talking and talking about how to do that and talking about very simple things like eliminating weapons of mass destruction, nuclear weapons from a region, 
once that ball starts to roll, it's going to keep going and we need to make sure that it gets started. I want to finish by saying right now, according to the best estimates, there are near 78 million people in Iran. That includes 11,500 Iranian Jews. Why would Israel want to bomb a bunch of Iranian Jews? They're apt to be victims as well. In addition to that, we know that Iran doesn't want to bomb Israel, Palestine, because Iran is a friend of the Palestinians. It's nonsense for anyone to believe that Iran is a real threat. Thank you.